Hello, my friends, and welcome. It's What's Up. John Peterson here from the Arlington Institute, and Greg Braden and I get together every two weeks for a half an hour or so to just chat about whatever's on our minds, and we're happy to have you with us. Greg, what's up? What you been thinking hey, about? John, it's good to see you, and uh, you know, there's so many things we, we could talk about. You and I had a conversation recently that the events unfolding in the world uh, are apparently not random. I think it's it's very clear that they're they're not random events that we're we're driving towards some some kind of an outcome. I'm looking at uh, another facet of that non-randomness, and the question that I asked is: Are we living out a script? Mm. Is is the the timeline or are the events of the timeline that we are are living is it mapped out uh, as, as a script and if it is mapped out do we succumb to that script or do we by virtue of consciousness and our free will is it part of our destiny to transcend not necessarily even fight but to become more than where that script apparently leads one of the ways that I've gone about uh, looking at this is looking at biblical history. Uh, back in the 1990s, I became a, a member of a, an organization that was called BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review. And it, was a, it was fascinating, John, because it was moving away from the religiosity of the Bible, rather looking at the Bible as uh, as a, a historical document of events that actually occurred. Now, when I was a kid, you know, a lot of the things in the Bible, I was growing up in the 50s, 60s, a lot of people thought, you know, those were make-believe things. And what Bibli Biblical Archaeology Review and some other organizations did is they began to, to take the Bible as a literal document of history, regardless of, of the religion. And so they'd say, well, you know, according to the Bible, these things happen here. What if we dig here? And we had sites like Ashkelon, uh, just uh, north of, of Gaza. And the uh, I've had the opportunity to be there personally, to visit the archaeological sites in Ashkelon and Jericho and uh, the, the tunnels under Solomon's temple and, and things like that. So what the, the Bible has shown historically is that it is based on information that is factual. When we think about a scripted timeline, the question is how deep do those facts run? And where this gets really interesting is because the events that we're seeing in the Middle East right now uh, are playing out uh, eerily similar to a time, to actually two timelines that we see in, uh, in parts of the Old Testament. So I'll, I'll be specific, and this is all in the Old Testament. There are two, there's one big war between good and evil that is the theme throughout the biblical text, but there are many battles. And there are two big battles that are identified. One of them is, is a mysterious battle, Psalms 83. Uh, and another one is the, the big one that people hear about in Ezekiel. Ezekiel was at 38 and 39. Uh, at the end of time in the Valley of Armageddon near Megiddo. And I've, I've been to those places as well. So the reason I'm, I'm thinking about this now is because the Psalm 83 battle identifies nations in biblical times that will converge, that will turn and converge upon Israel. Uh, and when we look at the modern names of those nations, it's exactly what's playing out right now with a couple of exceptions that have to change. And if we see those exceptions change, we're following this map that was laid out over 3,000 years ago. One of those exceptions is right now, Israel is on reasonably good terms. It's called a, uh, a cold treaty uh, with Jordan and with, with Egypt. 1979, the Camp David Accords with, uh, with Egypt Egypt now, for the first time since 1979, is threatening to walk away from those accords if Israel pr proceeds militarily in, in certain options. And if that happens, uh, it is actually fulfilling 
what some people call the prophecy of, of Psalm 83, uh, leading to the, the next great war. There are inner nations and outer nations. Psalm 83 is about the inner nations of, uh, of Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and, uh, and what we now call Gaza. The Ezekiel is about the outer nations, where they say the great nations from the north, uh, Iran and Russia, uh, converge with other nations. Uh, Turkey is part of that. Um, they call it Persia, which is now, now Iran, Tyre, which is now Lebanon. So the question as I'm looking at this, first, it's, it's eerie how similar the events are that are playing out now that are described in those texts. So number one, how did that happen? Is it a case of ancient remote viewers? Is that what we call those, those prophets? And number two, are we bound to those timelines or through the free will of our consciousness that's also described, can we, can we transcend those, those timelines? And I'm I uh, just wondering if you thought much about that, John. This is like a, a bigger, bigger picture. Well, what you, what I think about when you say that is that we're back in simulation world again. Yeah. That uh, we're that this is a some kind of a deterministic environment. That uh, certainly you have latitude within the game space, if you will, uh, within the design of the rules of the operating space, but you never thought you can't get outside, you, you know, outside of your lane. Uh, but you can run across uh, and and try any number of other kind of things. And it's a kind of a simplistic. Uh, it's clearly more complex and sophisticated than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the um, there is something. I mean, this goes back to the kind of the cyclical nature of, of reality. This is, goes almost directly to the underlying principles and the concepts underneath Martin Armstrong's computer, Socrates, and uh, uh, which says that everything in this reality uh, is based upon some kind of a cyclical uh, oscillatory kind of process. And so no matter whether you take the weather or politics or education or family relationships or, you know, anything around, Armstrong's got 75 of them that he's isolated and that figured out. He says, you know, it just keeps coming together and they keep doing it. And sometimes they're additive, sometimes they're subtractive and so on. But that's, again, like saying it's a big machine that you're inside of. And that there are, it, and it is therefore predictable, which of course is what the Marty Armstrong uses the whole thing for. And so you've just raised it to another kind of level. One of the interesting things about the last uh, maybe decade uh, is this uh, the kind of the emergence of this idea, for me at least, is the emergence of this idea of this living in a simulation. And uh, uh, as you know, I've had a number of experiences with where I've been kind of shown that it's a simulation of one sort or another. And that then makes, raises all kinds of deep kind of questions about what this is all about. And is there a God and what's heaven and all these kinds of things that I at least grew up with that were kind of the core components of <laughs> the operating yeah. space that we were constrained with. And so, uh, no, I think it's really quite interesting. Well, so when I think about this from the mathematic perspective, you know, when I've done seminars based on this, people, it's for, I'm just going to first acknowledge it's a very different way of thinking for, for a lot of people. You and I toss around these terms and ideas. And if this is new for some people, when, when you think of a simulation, it is based on an iterative formula. Uh, and the when I, I spent a lot of time studying fractals when I was in the defense industry uh, in terms of software development. And fractals are fascinating and they're so simple, John. And the, the whole idea of, of a fractal is that you, you have a, um, the fractal image that we're used to seeing is the picture representation of, of a mathematic formula. Of and when you 
shift that formula so the formula is represented by the letter R, for example, and you shift the formula R plus one. The plus one could be a change in the environment. It could be a change in society. It could be a change in our belief systems. R plus one, that then becomes the input for the next iteration yeah, of, right. of, that, of that calculation. Well, where this gets interesting is that the best science of the modern world has shown us they have reduced our natural world into some combination of only about four fractal patterns wow. that are they are are combined and they are iterative that is what a simulation is that's yeah. what keeps the simulation running it's every time something changes then that change is fed back yeah. into yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the the equation. So, so from that perspective, my question, what I think about is within that formula, I see no reason that we do not have the latitude and the freedom to uh, to break out of those fractal patterns to create new fractal patterns. I don't think it would break the simulation. And I've had people say to me, well, you're you're going to break break the simulation. I don't think it would do that. Well, how then is it predictive in the terms that you're kind of suggesting? Well, this I think this is the essence of what our lives and our time are all about. That we've also heard that this is a, an experiment, that we're living this great experiment where yeah. we have some degree of free will. So if we follow and succumb to the script, we're not using, I guess we're using our free will to follow what we believe is predetermined. But And if, if we are to take the, the freedoms that have been described, whether it's the biblical text or whether it's in biological text or whatever it is, of choice, free will, and consciousness, and we choose not to follow that timeline we choose not to have those wars now right. i i see nothing that prevents us from doing that but everyone that i talk to and all of the sources i'm looking at feel that it is predetermined so it must come to pass and and i i don't know that that's true well i don't know that it's true either but if it, if it turns out to be the truth then you're into you know what is who you are humans and what is this purpose of this human experience and yeah i mean you're in the, these deep kind of uh, existential kind of questions that uh ah, you know i'm not particularly interested in <laughs> well i i think i i think the there are layers to this john and i i think the the simulation i think the evidence strongly supports some kind of a simulation it may not be what we think of as a computer program oh, yeah on a disc, the universe as, as a simulation. I think what we're seeing is that at least there are portions of our simulation that may have been hijacked or uh, or or there's an intervention that maybe was not accounted for initially that's driving us toward these very dark outcomes. When you look at the biblical text, the purpose of the wars is to erase the darkness and to enter into a thousand years of peace or a yeah. thousand years of, uh, you know, with with without the evil. And I'm wondering, are the wars the only way to get there? Can we create that peace? If we're in a simulation, can we create that peace without having the wars? So, so what's going to be very interesting in the next few weeks and months, if we see Jordan, Turkey, and uh, and especially Egypt, if Egypt walks away from the treaty they have with Israel, then it will actually be uh, Psalm 83. Now, this is, you know, 2000 year old language, 3000 year old language. It, it actually says, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. The other interesting thing I see in here, John, nowhere, nowhere either in the mathematic codes that we've talked about called the Bible codes or the Torah codes or in the, the biblical text. I'm, I'm reaching over here because I've got a stack of old Bibles here. I collect them. Nowhere is the United States of America mentioned. 
And to me, that says a couple of possible things. Either by the time these events unfold in the timeline, America as we know it no longer exists. We've talked about this, uh, about the breakup of, uh, of America. Uh, or America does exist, but it's no longer called America. Maybe it has a different name. But the experiment uh, that began over 200 years ago of giving people the right to self-determination and the freedoms to do that uh, appears to be winding down, coming to an end. Uh, and at uh, least, yeah, yeah, at least on these timelines, you would think as the, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, on these great battles that we would be involved in mentioned in some way. And I, I personally don't see that. I'm still looking into it, but I don't see it from what I've seen so far. Well, as you know, uh, Martin Armstrong's computer says that uh, there's a global civil war between between 2025 next year and um, 2027, after which the United States breaks up as a country and there are five other countries that get formed in North America. So, you know, you, you always have that kind of uh, possibility. Uh, so now now we've got two scenarios playing out that are interacting. We've got this scenario, this simulation, where we're barreling down this script toward a confrontation that ultimately leads to freedom and peace. Yeah. It's a big picture. We also have what you and I talked about recently on, I think, one of these episodes where there is a movement uh, to hijack humanness and to hijack this planet, which appears to be counter to the the big well, the big is, script that we're, we're talking catalyst, about. The catalyst, of course, yeah. that that kicks the system up, and everybody stands up and says, "Enough of this!" and uh, we're not going to do this anymore because it's certainly raising up to some level there's a threshold somewhere where you know these you talk about the truckers who are they're not going to do it now but the truckers who are going to kind of shut down new york uh there is a lot of stuff uh that can be done uh that uh, ha ha hasn't yet been done and that could really disrupt the uh, you kind of... Oh, yeah. Well, I think for, for our viewers, I'm just going to say, I know this is a very different way of, of thinking for a lot of people. John and I spend a lot of time systems thinkers looking at big pictures that are driving the the minutia of, of our everyday lives. And whether this makes sense or not, I think what we're seeing is this is a time where we identify clearly for ourselves and then we claim. It's not enough to be aware of it. We must claim the values that we cherish uh, as individuals and families, certainly as community societies, hopefully as a nation, whatever those values are for us. And I think almost universally, life and freedom are, are among those, at least that's what we say. Uh, and now we're gonna be given the opportunity to put into action what it means and, and how much we cherish those as there are forces that would like to take them from us Mm -hmm. including uh, our very human nature. Our humanness is on the line. Yeah. And we've talked about that in other programs as well. I have a friend who's writing a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, if <laughs> next time you next time you talk to him, send him my way. I need the muse to help me with mine. <laughs> well, let's, let's just end this and thank you uh, for this. But uh, one of the interesting possible, almost certainties associated with kind of considering these kinds of questions is that this stuff might be too complicated for us to even understand. And what we're delimited is by the kind of the models and the patterns and the kind of the ideas that we kind of brought into the room with us. I've had uh, uh, people, as a matter of fact, with, with somebody this last weekend, our speaker, and talking about uh, whether it was a, a simulation that we live in and uh, she went out to her channel source and the source said well in terms that you can understand it's uh you could call it a simulation and the kind of the clear uh implication is that it's above our pay grade and there are things going on here that uh, we're not yet able to fully integrate and make sense out of 
And somehow you've just uh, got to kind of work your way through this thing. Well, I, I, very sensitive to the little uh, indicators that uh, I, I, you know, John, I agree with that hundred percent, but here's the thing. We humans are so unique in that we do not know what the top end of our processing capabilities are. And the reason is because we have these conversations and we're pushing against those those preconceived boundaries, what we're doing is we're building neural networks that open the door to deeper yeah. understandings. We are yeah. capable of it. We probably are not there now, but I think we are capable of it. And that's oh, why I, I appreciate you and I appreciate the opportunity to have these conversations. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yep. Well, thank All you right. very much. And for those of you in the audience, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And it's always fun for Greg and me to, uh, get together and uh, you know and have these unscripted uh, uh, unplanned organiz uh, conversations and we'll come back and do it all again in another couple of weeks in the meantime you can find out all kinds of things about the Arlington Institute where this all comes from at arlingtoninstitute.org and we hope that you'll uh, go there and uh, rummage around and look at the, the many kind of things that we have and I hope that you'll share this with uh, in your networks and that you'll tell your friends about this and that you'll join and become uh, a member of uh, of this so thank you so much thank you greg See thank you, you so much john thanks everyone for uh, sharing a little bit of your day with us today look forward to our next take care